Coming up on today's episode of Endo Genius. Consuming a food that normally, that has actually a taste, in this case, a sweet taste, but there are actually zero calories that go along with it. Your body learns over time that sweet taste does not mean calories. And therefore, when I taste the sweet, I'm not going to start responding to it in the proper way. So normally when we consume something that's sweet, it has sugar in it and Mm. insulin is released in response to it. Welcome to episode one of Endo Genius. People think about food a lot, like all the time. And obviously we have time to think about food. It's part of what makes us human. We wouldn't survive without it. But usually our thoughts revolve around what we're going to eat. What are we having for dinner is a daily discussion in most homes. We might also talk about the kinds of foods we love. You know, what's your favorite food? That's probably one of my kids' favorite questions. But we don't dive to a deeper level than that. And we typically don't stop to think about why we eat what we eat and what's driving those decisions. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Rachel Herz about exactly that. Rachel is a psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist who's a pioneer in the field of olfaction, taste, and flavor relationships to emotion. She spent decades researching and developing world-renowned expertise in neurogastronomy, that's the psychology and neuroscience of eating behavior. Rachel is a faculty member at Brown University's Department of Psychiatry, and human behavior. She's a part-time faculty at the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Boston College, the author of three books, The Scent of Desire, Discovering Our Enigmatic Sense of Smell, That's Disgusting, Unraveling the Mysteries of Repulsion, and the subject of today's conversation, Why You Eat What You Eat, The Science Behind Our Relationship with Food, all linked in the show notes. Rachel's also an entrepreneur, a TEDx speaker, and she's a valued consultant to international corporations on fragrance, flavor, taste, and much more. Today, we're going to discuss the role of evolutionary biology in dietary choices, how marketing, advertising, and shopping environments impact what we eat, how mindset about food might be more powerful than what we actually consume in terms of our physiological response to that food, the role that smell plays in eating behavior, and how to improve the relationship with food in a healthy way. Let's get on with the show. Just a reminder that this podcast is for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. If you need medical advice, please consult a healthcare professional. Hi, Rachel. Welcome. Uh, Thank you for being the first guest to the Endogenius podcast. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me, Ahmed. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that looking into your your history and the research that you've done, that you're a pioneer in the field of olfaction. Uh, So it's, it's really fascinating to me that you started studying and and publishing work on why we eat what we eat, the science behind our relationship with food. Tell me a little bit about how you got into that field. Well, so everything that I've researched for my whole career has been basically trying to examine the intersection and the interaction between biology and psychology. And actually the sense of smell is a perfect vehicle for doing that, as is food. I mean, one of the things that we all kind of potentially take for granted but and might not completely realize, but our sense of smell is hugely involved in our experience of eating. It's what produces the sensation of flavor. So taste is just salt, sour, sweet, bitter, and maybe you want to include umami. I, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I don't necessarily include it in terms of the basic taste, but, but nevertheless, our experience of food is extremely informed by our sense of smell. And also the experience of food and eating really does cross the the intersection of biology and psychology really well. And so on top of the, that being sort of the major sort of fundamental crux, I also, you know, some of my other books, my first book is actually all about the sense of smell. It's called The Scent of Desire. My second book is actually about the emotion of disgust. It's called That's Disgusting. And believe it or not, disgust is in fact a taste-based emotion. Mm-hmm. It is sort of scaffolded on our, our sort of innate reaction to rejecting bitter taste. So the face you make when you are tasting something super bitter and the face you make if I say, hold your neighbor's dirty dentures in your in your hand would be actually the exact same face. So the people aren't quite as interested in the emotion of disgust or even in the sense of smell as they are in food. <laughs> so I also wanted to write a book that would have like, you know, large spread appeal and most people love eating. I'm one of them. And almost every, and actually, and everybody has to eat to survive. So I thought that it would be, sort of, you know, generate a lot of interest overall. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to applaud you too, because there's a lot of, I mean, there's no shortage of information about food and diet and uh, those kinds of materials tend to be focused on how-to guides or, you know, recipe books and things like that. And there's a lot of guilt 
and shame that I think comes along with it in, in the traditional diet industry or weight loss industry. And I think they that's done on purpose. They kind of market themselves that way and they they play off of people's fears or insecurities about themselves to try to benefit from it. Uh, and it works. There's a lot of helpful advice out there, but your work is different in that it's 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 stepping back from that and saying, no, look, this is why you're you're actually making the food choices that you're making. It's not so simple as saying, uh, this is what you're supposed to do, so just do it. Mm -hmm. No, I think that you're making a really good point. And unfortunately, fear is, uh, or fortunately for other, you know, survival reasons, fear is an extremely motivating emotion and it gets a lot of attention. And so if you market, you know, the topic of eating in a fearful manner, you know, preying on people's insecurities, playing on their vulnerabilities and, you know, playing on all the marketing and the media that sort of espouses certain images and ideals, you're certainly going to get a lot of people to jump on board to what is the latest trend? What is the latest book? What's the latest information that I have to find out about that's going to solve my problems, my relationship with food. But actually, my the purpose behind my book really is, and behind all my work, is sort of the idea that information and knowledge is power. So understanding all the things that go into our interactions with food. So for instance, all the sensory things. So not just obviously what we smell and taste, but how things look, even sort of the packaging around what we're eating, how things sound, the crunch that you would make in your mouth while you're chewing a, um, eating a potato chip, for instance, as well as the sound that the bag makes even as mm. you're opening it, the, the texture of things and, you know, sort of all these other aspects that are really sensory. And then there's a huge aspect, which is psychological and social and environmental, whether it be our personality the a mood we're in, our social environment, even the sort of general environment that we're in. So all these things go into our perception of food, the experience of eating, and even the consequences of metabolizing that food. Mm -hmm. And what I really wanted people to do is understand all of those variables so that they could then say, okay, what's going on at this particular moment? Here I am in this situation, the chocolate cake is in front of me. I really want it. Now take one second to step back and see maybe if you can incorporate some of what is in the book to try to sort of inform your decision and help you make a healthier and happier decision. Absolutely. And there's a ton of helpful information in there. Uh, and the science that you back it up with is great. And it's it's really easy to read. It's not one of those books that's kind of dense where you have trouble finding the key takeaways. You you lay it out there in a way that the lay person with no scientific background can can understand, which is great. But you touched on something that's really interesting to me coming from kind of like a geology and environmental science standpoint. I have to study human evolution. And from an evolutionary perspective, uh, not liking sweet foods and, and, you know, liking exercise are kind of maladaptive, you know, so we want to naturally go after those high or calorie dense foods, the sweeter foods, because that tells us or that triggers uh, an indication biologically that that is something that's going to sustain us. Uh, so coming from 99.9% .9 of human history where we were hunting and gathering and trying to conserve as much ener energy as we could to now trying to limit our intake of food because one, it's it's everywhere. Uh, the options that are around us are typically not the healthiest, especially the ones that are in our face and being marketed to us. Uh, I think there is kind of growing consensus in the community now. There are a lot of functional medicine doctors, a lot of psychiatrists that are sounding the alarm and saying, you know, we're eating on average as Americans 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. We're eating almost half a pound of sugar a day per person in the United States, over 150 pounds a year. Uh, and this is driving uh, the metabolic disease epidemic that we're facing in the country. So uh, I think that people, uh, so Doc Amen, for instance, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Dr. Daniel Amen. He's a, a double board certified psychiatrist, has the highest or the largest uh, database of spec imaging, uh, brain imaging. Uh, in the world, he phases it as kind of like uh, a, a subconscious assault that's happening all the time on our subconscious that's getting us to make choices that are against our own best interests and longevity. Uh, and you touched on this a little bit with marketing and advertising and how that affects us. So how exactly does marketing affect us physiologically or you know, how does that induce us? What triggers do they play on to get us to buy their products? 
So first of all, just to take a step back from what you've just said, so I, I love that you have an evolutionary background because that is my sort of theoretical foundation. I, During my graduate training, I, I was very steeped in, in that. And so I really come from that perspective when I think about the motivations and the problems that we face in current society. So absolutely, we are in an unnatural environment from the standpoint of how we evolved and the ecology within which we evolved. And so we are faced with challenges which we are essentially not programmed to deal with in a straightforward way. And we really have to kind of stop our instincts in a sense to make healthier choices given the sort of access and excess uh, that we are faced with on a, on a daily basis. And also, unfortunately, and for many people who live in what are known as food deserts, where their access is really only to really unhealthy foods, really ultra processed foods, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit more later. Mm -hmm. But the idea that, you know, the, the, the sort of fundamental kind of truism of eat like a peasant, live like a king or a queen really is true. So you want to sort of get back to those basics. Absolutely. Now to deal with your question about marketing, I mean, you're sort of dealing with the kind of the... Um, conundrum of big business that wants to make money. So they want to make a profit. They want to sell you what they're producing and what they're producing may not be very healthy. And there's all kinds of ways that marketing schemes manipulate us when it comes to food from the simplest things like how packaging is, is prepared. So, you know, packaging for high calorie, high hedonic food. So things that are really tasty, potato chips, chocolates, cookies, you know, and so forth is done in a way to lure us to them, you know, from the simplest things of color, sort of like bright colors, yellow, orange, red, um, to things like the way that the, the sort of imagery of what you're eating is portrayed on the package, you know, the sort of the more iterations. So like you see a lot of, you know, potato chips there, you're going to want it more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even from the point of view of store displays, location, things like that. So there's all kinds of aspects of the way that marketing, even without having a commercial in front of you in any way, shape or form, just the way that your attention is drawn to those products within a shopping environment is such that it really grabs your attention and leads you to it. And of course, there's, you know, they even often capitalize on things that we consider maybe healthier in terms of making choices, like using terminology like all natural. Um, you know, my husband and I were laughing last night, actually, we were eating almonds, and they said it was tamari almonds, all natural. It's like, to marry almonds do not grow on trees. <laughs> I mean, yes, this is, you know, it doesn't have preservatives, you know, it doesn't have this or that, but to sure. marry was added to it that is actually not natural. Mm -hmm. But the language of using words like that, which we connote as being connected to health, can sure. be used in all kinds of ways that can be misleading. And one of the worst ones, I think, from the point of view of misleading us for health is using terminology like organic. Mm. And that can really make people presume that there's all kinds of health benefits for eating this food when actually there are not. So organic chocolate chip cookies mm. are really not any healthier for you than regular chocolate chip cookies. They typically have just as much you know, fat, sugar, calories, and so forth. And the concept of organic and where we kind of get confused, organic has to do with production. You know, it's saying something maybe that's better about the way the crops were grown or maybe the way that the people who were, you know, producing this were, were treated, but it doesn't have anything to do with the content. So it's not to say that the content is actually healthier, but we make this assumption. It's kind of, it's what's known as a health halo effect. We think the word organic connotes health. So anything connected to it also seems healthier. And that can mislead us and make us think it's really okay to eat the organic French fries and the organic chocolate chip cookies when actually they're just as potentially bad for us as the non-organic versions. Yeah, and I, I'm guilty of that as well. I mean, early on in my health journey, I, I, I've made similar mistakes. So I, I think the key takeaway there is for the most part, trying to stay away from highly processed packaged foods, because whether they're labeled, you know, organic or non-GMO, and sometimes they're not even GMO foods that they're referring to in there. You know, I, I'll pick up a pack of, or a, a jar of pickles and it'll say gluten-free on them. There's no gluten in, in pickles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but staying away from those packaged foods, that's where, which is where we're getting the majority of our carbohydrates and our sugar uh, that's driving that chronic ep disease epidemic. But you know, while we're on the subject of these labels, there's a section in your book called 
uh, mean and green, which mm-hmm. I thought was really fascinating. And you referred to a study, or you cited a study from Loyola University in New Orleans uh, that pointed to the fact that if people think that they are making decisions that are morally superior, it actually leads them to uh, either become more dismissive of moral transgressions or make or leads them to make amoral choices uh, somewhere down the line. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, no, you did. You actually did a perfect job summarizing <laughs> that study. So basically, um, what this research found was exactly that. So you know, using the term organic uh, in labeling for simple products that you would potentially buy, like whether it be fruits or condiments or, or treats, would make people react in a more negative way when it came to making decisions themselves to be generous, to be more altruistic, and to be more sort of uh, less condemning and harsh in evaluating other people. And so this is something called moral licensing, where once we feel we've done something good in one domain of our life, we feel that it gives us a pass in others. And so one of the things sort of to take a little bit of a step back is that, you know, human beings are essentially selfish and from an evolutionary standpoint that's actually generally helpful i mean aside from sort of the altruistic things which are generally also to help ourselves in kind of a collective sense we are always worried about our own survival and the survival of us with whom we are related and that means that we want to make sure that we're doing the best for ourselves all the time and we don't really care that much about the stranger the outside world and so forth And this sort of leads us also from the point of view of even moral decisions when we feel like, you know, I feel like it's a good thing to, if I were to say organic is better than a non-organic, you know, product for the environment, let's just say that's the way I think about it, then that's made me feel that I've done something good for the environment. And now I don't have to worry about doing good things to, you know, in general for like the next hour or two. And so that could lead me to behave in a much harsher way. I mean, one of the interesting things about all these studies that were done in relationship to how sort of green um, advertising, organic advertising makes people more selfish, makes people less kind and so forth, is they were all done within a short temporal period of time. So it's not like, you know, there was a, a five hour delay and let's see what the effect is. And Generally speaking, I think these things are very transient. So Mm. you feel good about yourself. And then the next step, you know, you're, you're sort of blocking someone from getting into a parking spot or something like that. And so the, the sort of takeaway from this is that people that are in the parking lots of places like Whole Foods are super aggressive with each other and, you know, a lot less kind than they might be if they were in a parking lot of a sort of a, a much more down market, you know, shopping environment where they haven't had that chance to feel superior about themselves. And so that makes them actually generally nicer in a, in a small context anyway. Yeah, I wonder if you could extend that beyond that short instance. So if we're if we're picking up a food that's either labeled organic or or non-GMO or it says natural on it, and you know we get the sense of moral superiority, like we're making a good decision, helping save the environment. Uh, how does that apply to you know somebody who makes their dietary choices and and kind of adopts that as a lifestyle? So that's something that they they are are practicing for a long period of time. Would that because we we'll see you know if you get on social media, you see people having spats between, you know, carnivores or keto versus vegan. And, you know, everybody seems to take the moral high ground there. Yes. Well, I mean, I think that's actually really interesting. And one of the other things which also connects back to the marketing, what that we were talking about earlier, is actually even the labeling of products like honest tea. So using words which are morally charged in the labeling of products themselves can have I think a carryover effect that lasts longer than the immediate moment of saying that I, you know, I, I did something good for the environment by buying X instead of Y. Mm. So I do think it's interesting that people who are constantly exposed to both labeling that sort of implies moral superiority, as well as maybe sort of taking a, a kind of a stance on the way that, that you're eating. I mean, people feel, I think, very strongly when they have made a certain dietary choice that this is the right way to be and that people who aren't following the same prescriptions when it comes to food are doing it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And I think that that just, you know, any kind of identity dimension, which defines me versus you ultimately, unfortunately is negative. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I want to sort of bring up is that it's really a privilege and a luxury to be able to make those kinds of choices and to be able to say, you know what, I'm taking this particular stance with respect to food and and this is my worldview and then it extends from there because many people 
within North America and certainly beyond do not have the choice to be able to make that, you know, moral decision, if it's a moral decision or not. And so that in and of itself, I think is partially where that sort of negative attitude comes from. I mean, people don't even realize that they're in a very privileged position to be able to make that choice. And then they sort of denigrate others for not making the same choice. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you kind of spoke about this earlier about food deserts, because, you know, we, we know that the higher a person's income, the less likely they are to be obese. And that might be because, you know, if you drive through uh, an affluent neighborhood, you're not going to see the fast food or the cornerstones with the highly processed food and chips and things like that. You might see a Whole Foods uh, and a, a, a nice grocery store that may not be available mm-hmm. uh, in lower income neighborhoods, even here in, in America. Um, so, yeah. And then I think that diets, a lot of the time, while, while there is a lot of good that can come from them, they do drive binary thinking and especially the, the purveyors or you know the founders or the people that develop these diets and want to push them, they kind of promote that kind of thinking, put pitting one person against the other. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit, if I may, because one of the things that was really fascinating about your book was the fact that how we think about a food that we, regardless of its actual contents, regardless if it's caloric value, uh, our mindset can actually have a physiological response. We may, we may or may not produce the hormones necessary to, to get hungry or not hungry. I don't want to go into it too much. I'll let you explain, but please, please talk about that. Yeah. So this actually, from the point of view of the research that I did for this book was one of the most astounding things that I came across. And I know I really love this finding And Alia Crum, who's now at Stanford is the one who's behind this research. Mm-hmm. She was at Yale university when she first did this study. And there have been other researchers who have, you know, taken off on this and, and done some other kinds of work, which basically all shows the same thing. And the, and the fact is it's mind over matter often when it comes to food in really surprising ways. And what she found was that, so she had a French vanilla milkshake that in reality had 380 calories. So not trivial, uh, not huge, but you know, not trivial. And she presented it to people under two different labeling conditions. One in which it was called indulgence and decadence you deserve. And this label that had this sort of look like a, a, a sundae on it. And it said 620 calories. And, and p- she gave people this milkshake with that label. And then she also gave the same people that same exact milkshake with really 380 calories with a label that said Sensi Shake, you know, no added sugar, 0% fat, only 140 calories. Mm. And sort of looking like, you know, kind of one of those slim line kind of advertising fonts and so forth. And what she found, and so she changed the order, so it wasn't that they had one first and then the other, so the orders were were reversed and and balanced and so forth. But what she found was she was looking at the hormone ghrelin. And ghrelin is often dubbed the hunger hormone. So it's a hormone that's released from our gut when we are hungry, and it signals to eat, Um, you know, makes us hungrier, makes us want to eat further. And what normally happens when we we have ghrelin released, let's say in anticipation of a meal and so on, or you know after a period of fasting, we then consume whatever food we are consuming. Our ghrelin levels drop back down, and our actually you know other hormones kick in like leptin and so forth. But in any case, it also increases our metabolism because our bodies have you know believed that we've consumed calories that have made the ghrelin levels drop, and we're actually burning off the calories from the food we've consumed. Now, what she found was that when people were given the milkshake with the Sensi Shake label, their ghrelin levels from start to finish of the study, and I think it was over like a two hour period, basically did not budge. Whereas people who were given the indulgent shake label, or when the same people rather got the indulgent shake label, their ghrelin levels first kind of shot up and then they dipped way lower. So they dropped, I think it was like three times more than the people who were in, or twice more, I'm not quite sure exactly right now, um, than the people who had, when they got the Sensi Shake version, which like I said, was kind of like flatlining. Mm. And so the takeaway from this is that our assumption about the caloric content of what we're consuming actually changes the way our body responds to the food that we're consuming, even though in reality, 380 calories are what people got every single time. So there's a couple of implications from this. First of all, when ghrelin level drops, then you're not hungry anymore. So you're not going to say like, oh, well, I better have another milkshake or eat something else. And secondly, as I said before, your metabolism revs up. So you're actually burning more calories. 
And other research has actually shown that when people think what they're eating is more caloric, um, they're more inclined to say no to eating further, whereas when people think what they're consuming is less caloric, and again, when they're isometric in terms of the real content, they'll they'll want to eat further later. So we're constantly kind of keeping this balance mentally, but also there's this sort of trick that our brains can do to us to make us think that we've consumed something in, in a caloric way when we actually have not. And the sort of the real thing to be able to do here, if we could, it's kind of like you can't really tickle yourself. I think this falls into the same category where, you know, if you could convince yourself that the yogurt that you're consuming is super high calories, then you'd be burning it much more efficiently than you would actually, unfortunately, probably from the labeling that is on that yogurt package, which may say low fat and has low calories and so forth. And so one of the things I think this also says is steer away from labeling, which is all about low calorie, low sugar, low fat, because even though you may be wanting to get foods like that, you want to avoid labeling that's really screaming that at you, because that labeling in and of itself can actually damp down your metabolism and not modulate your hunger level the way you might want it to from from consumption. That's fascinating because what it's really telling us is that what you're actually eating is kind of taking a back seat to your mindset about that food. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that mindset is not necessarily determined by you. It could just be, you know, something that's nudging you in a certain direction or to think about that food in a certain way. But I wonder what the limitations of that are, right? Like so it, it, it is affecting the hormone ghrelin, the hunger hormone. Uh, is, it, is there a, a corollary um, spike or drop in insulin depending on how we are thinking about the food? Yes. So actually Dana Small, who is at Yale University, has done research showing how our metabolism in other manners actually also changes and also how our brain changes as a function of how what we believe about what we're consuming is affecting how we're eating. And so there is other research which has shown that this is not just, you know, a simple response to let's say just ghrelin, but actually has neurological consequences, which then have downstream effects on physiology in general. And sort of one of the other things that's actually really important with respect to the whole insulin response, as you just mentioned, and this is this is work that Dana has done as well. It's sort of her aphorism from this is never drink a Diet Coke and, while eating French fries. Mm. And this is because when you're constantly consuming a food that normally that has actually a taste, in this case, a sweet taste, but there are actually zero calories that go along with it, your body learns over time that sweet taste does not mean calories. And therefore, when I taste the sweet, I'm not going to start responding to it in the proper way. So normally when we consume something that's sweet, it has sugar in it and mm -hmm. insulin is released in response to it. Now, if you taste something sweet and actually there is no sugar in it and there's no calories, over time your body is going to stop making the sort of insulin adjustments that it normally does in response to foods that have tastes that signify nu nutrients of a specific kind. And so what ends up happening in this case is that insulin levels remain, in fact, chronically high. And that actually leads to a variety of metabolic disorders and fundamentally also means that you're not responding properly to other food that has high calorie at the same time as you're consuming it. So basically your body is kind of in this, again, sort of non-responsive mode and not using the calories that they're, you're actually consuming as a function of sort of how your brain has learned to to misread or, or read, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, the environment that it's in, because you're having these cues, which normally physiologically indicate something, and yet they don't. And, and that leads to a variety of systems being sort of manipulated in a sense, such that they don't respond to the environment of food correctly. And that then leads to these metabolic problems. Yeah. And, that, and that's interesting too. So I think a little bit of what I'm taking away in terms of the, the analogy with the uh, the Diet Coke and the French fries is when you have the Diet Coke with the non-caloric sweetener, the aspartame or whatever it may be, your body is focused on processing that. And then it kind of just stores the potatoes and, and doesn't know what to do with them. So it stores them as fat or is that, or am I misinterpreting? Um, well, so not, not quite. So maybe I should explain this a little. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. So basically no. if you have a Diet Coke occasionally, this is not a problem. And if you have a Diet Coke without eating anything else, it's also not a problem because you haven't actually gotten real calories at the same time. But if you have, if your body over time has learned that taste of sweet 
does not correlate with calories. And therefore, mm. I don't need to, this is the anthropomorphic body, need to respond to calories coming in. But actually, there are calories coming in. The body is not going to metabolize those properly as it would have if you just ate the French fries by itself because the French fries have not I mean, it'd be really dangerous if we lived in a world where the, the feel of fat in our mouth and the taste of salt in our mouth also started to indicate no calories and, you know, all these sort of signals that our body normally takes in as meaningful from the point of view of nutrients stop being meaningful and then our bodies just stop responding to them. But fortunately, we don't have zero calorie French fries <laughs> so that, you know, normally if you just have calorie uh, French fries by itself, you're going to metabolize that in a way that's appropriate. But but French fries are carbohydrates and sugar are carbohydrates and your body responds to carbohydrates fundamentally the same way. Mm. So if they taste sugar and, and actually the response is, well, there's nothing really there. And then sugar being a carbohydrate, you get another carbohydrate at the same time, your body's not going to metabolize it the way that it should. But like I said, if there are no other calories coming with it, so you're just having a Diet Coke in the middle of the afternoon with nothing else, that's okay. And mm. if you're just eating French fries by itself, you know, that's also that's okay. okay. And also if you only occasionally do this, it's okay. But it's people who habitually drink diet or non-nutritive sweeteners mm -hmm. with um, meals that are actually very dense in calories. And that's where the problem starts to come in, where the body stops responding right. to the calories in the way that it should. Well, that's probably one of the first times that I've heard that in a way that was really clear and concise. So thank you for okay. explaining that. Yeah. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, obviously. And uh, one of the symptoms of COVID-19 that a lot of people have faced, and I, I know people that personally lost their sense of smell for one to two days. And I've read stories about chefs that have not been able to work because they lost their sense of smell due to coronavirus and were mm. not able to regain that sense. Mm. Um, but from my perspective, being interested in people's food choices, dietary choices, uh, I imagine that not being able to smell with, with how uh, interwoven that is with taste might affect your food choices to some degree. Can you talk about that for me? Oh, absolutely. And unfortunately, this also comes into play when people, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, you know, the one of the positives to the coronavirus in terms of how it has affected society, and to the extent that there may be any positives, one, I think is that, you know, we can start to interact more virtually, you know, with so much greater ease. The other, I mean, from my perspective, the biggest thing is that how people have been made aware of the importance of their sense of smell and how it's involved in so many aspects of their life and and to not take it for granted, which is sort of, you know, really my my sort of, you know, rallying cry, as it were. Yeah. But um with respect to food consumption is interesting. And I, and prior to the pandemic, I worked not infrequently with people who, for instance, had been in a car accident or some kind of traumatic brain injury situation, which might not even look like it's severe at all. But what mm. ends up happening is they lose their sense of smell as a function of that, and all kinds of things change for them. And of course, eating is one of the major ones and one of the things people notice first, because as I mentioned earlier, you know, our sense of taste is just salt, sour, sweet, and bitter. Everything else we get when we're consuming food comes from what's happening when we have food in our mouth and the aroma molecules in our mouth actually go up into our nose through a little opening in the back of our mouth. And so we're smelling the aroma at the same time as we're chewing the food or it's in our, mm. in our mouth. And that together produces this experience of flavor. And you can even, if you've ever had a really bad cold or just been congested and you eat something that doesn't taste right, that's mm. because an airway is blocked. So mm. breathing while eating gives us this perception of flavor. So the, the taste of bacon is just salt. Everything mm. else that we perceive when we eat bacon is due to its scent. So that being said, what some people might think of, and this does sometimes happen sort of at least initially, is when you don't get, you know, the pleasure from food, which really primarily comes from that aroma flavor experience, you're like, I don't feel like eating. And so some people initially will end up losing weight, but what ends up happening typically long term is people gain weight. And this is because, I mean, on one level, there's often kind of some yo-yoing that takes place. So people are like, I, I'm so craving, let's say, chocolate. Mm. And I'm eating chocolate and it's just not working. And I'm going to eat more and more just sort of try to make it work, but it's not. And so then I kind of give up on it. And then maybe I don't eat very much. And so I lose weight and then I sort of bounce around. 
But what ends up typically happening long term, and this is for people where we really see it as for people who have permanent smell loss after an accident or injury, is that because the pleasures of eating come from, you know, the, the fatty creaminess of food and the sweetness of food and often the saltiness of food as well as the aroma, those things, because they are rewarding and pleasurable are the kinds of foods that people end up eating a lot of. So mm -hmm. eating high fat, high sweet, high salty foods, which are not very healthy, and then also end up leading to weight gain. So hopefully, you know, there are a sort of a, a notable minority of people who have unfortunately a maintained smell loss throughout many, many months. And we don't know how long that might last. Right. Um, the good news is I think that there are many you know, there's there's many hopeful sort of findings and and ways that people can potentially regain their sense of smell. Smell training, which I've worked on, um, is actually something that can be really helpful. Unlike something that happens when you've been in an accident where neurologically you can no longer smell. So that mm. that's a little bit of a different scenario. Although sure. sometimes there's some help there. But the but the problem comes in is that we because eating is so pleasurable and we do it because it gives us pleasure when the only thing that we can get that's pleasurable is the sweetness and the saltiness and the fattiness that ends up being the kinds of foods we consume. So it ends up being something that leads to a much unhealthier diet overall. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm seeing a little bit of that myself now because you know my, my wife's grandmother is still alive, for instance, and she's approaching her her mid eighties. Uh, and she's always been very health conscious. Uh, you know, she, she grew up here in the South. So she was very in touch with the land. She eats seasonally, um, and always stays in shape. She still does yoga six days a week, but as she's aging, I'm noticing that she's going towards these foods that she never would have eaten before. Um, she, she's using a lot more condiments and, and eating a lot more packaged foods. So she always has Cheetos in the house, for instance, you know, and, and we know that these, these processed foods are, are kind of designed to hijack our taste buds because they have so much flavor packed into them. So I'm seeing a little bit of that now. Um, and it's interesting because it's something we take for granted a little bit. We know that people lose their vision and their hearing as they age because, you know, they'll start wearing glasses and those bifocals will get thicker and thicker and, and you have to kind of yell louder for them to hear you whenever you talk to them as they get older and older. But we don't think about smell because it's something we can't see. Uh, and, and it's very, it varies on an individual basis. Uh, but that begs the question then, how can we, or what behaviors can we change to preserve our sense of smell as we get older? So um, I'm really glad you brought this up. So it's, it's absolutely true that as we get older, our sense of smell starts to decline, typically maybe starting around the mid to late fifties. But as you pointed out, there's a lot of individual variability. And what happens, the way that our sense of smell works is that we actually have these olfactory sensory neurons that are directly in our nose. And in fact, they're exposed to the environment and they're constantly throughout our normal sort of younger years, turning over and we're getting new sensory neurons all the time. But what happens as we get older actually is those neurons die off and they don't get replaced to the same extent. So when people start to lose their sense of smell as they age, you're getting a greater die off to regeneration ratio. And so the sense becomes weaker and weaker. Although, as you pointed out, there's a lot of variability. So to make up for that, and the fact is, this is extremely gradual. So it's not like I wake up one morning and, oh my God, you know, I can't smell anything. Because it's so gradual, people don't really realize it's happening. And to augment their perception of what they're eating, they use more salt, they use more condiments, they use more uh, sweeteners in whatever they're consuming. And they also, as you pointed out, turn to things that are hyper palatable, like, you know, Cheez-Its and, and other foods like that that have a lot of flavor in them. So even though they're only getting a small amount of that flavor, they still are probably getting some of that aroma to give them the flavor, but they need a lot more sort of punch in order to be able to get something that they feel is acceptable. Mm -hmm. So with respect to being able to sort of maintain a healthy sense of smell over our lifetime as much as possible, I mean, there's a couple of things. So one is actually paying attention to smell in general, kind of focusing in on how things smell. So using more of your brain to be aware of the smells in your environment actually enables you to smell more. So thinking about smell while we're undergoing, you know, various scented experiences, but more directly, and I brought this up with, with COVID is that there's something called olfactory training or smell training. 
that's actually been extremely helpful for people who have smell loss due to um, viral infections and COVID being one of them. And this doesn't always, you know, not 100% guaranteed to work, but it can be really helpful. It even can be helpful in people who are losing their sense of smell with other illnesses. For instance, um, you know, there's other neurological illnesses that have loss of smell as being a component. And it seems that if it's done early enough, it may even be helpful for people who have this neurological damage, like from an accident. So mm -hmm. what you do in smell training, and this is something I think that, you know, people should do, you know, throughout life. And so like the idea of exercising throughout life, this is a form of exercise for your nose is a few times a day, you know, take a set of very distinctive smells and you can get kits for this, but you can also just go to your spice rack or whatever, you know, collect things from your house. So for instance, um, a typical four set would be lemon, vanilla, you know, menthol, and, and a perfumey smell or something along those lines. So you can, you know, find things that smell really different from each other and then sniff them, you know, very deliberately. And if possible, also smell it and think about sort of what it is. So if you're smelling vanilla, think about, oh, you know, this is really reminding me of, you know, some kind of cookies that my grandmother used to make for me. So get a kind of a more expanded mental image of what it is that you're sniffing and do that with each of the smells just for like, you know, 10 seconds each or whatever, a few times a day, every day. And, uh, you know, Sometimes, you know, within a few months, that's helpful enough. But if not, then switch to another set of four smells that are different, really different from each other and, and keep going. So mm. even if you can't smell the vanilla initially, you know, knowing that it is vanilla and thinking those thoughts connected to it and kind of dredging up sort of vanilla imagery will help over time re-stimulate. Uh, it looks like both the, the neurological growth that's happening in our brain as well as the periphery when it comes to our sense of smell and although it's not fully worked out how this is happening it seems like it's this combination of both cognitive neurological and peripheral you know physiological changes that are taking place by doing this that's amazing so yeah definitely strengthening your sense of smell uh, and doing it earlier on will make it more resilient over time so you know you can make the case that you should keep your children in the kitchen with you, have them cooking with you and, and get them exposed to those scents early on. And, and they're going to have that, uh, that stronger sense of smell and more heightened sense. Well, as just as to sort of, just to backtrack for a second, I think that that teaches healthy habits, mm. but because our sense of smell, because those neurons are normally just, you know, dying off and being replaced anyhow, you do need to keep this up throughout your life. So just because you did it, you know, while you were a kid and then you stopped doing it, mm. that would ne not necessarily be helpful in, in your older ears as you're losing your sense of smell for real, but rather this is teaching you the healthy habits of, I need to be sniffing deliberately. I need to be mm. thinking about smells. I need to be incorporating kind of a mindfulness when it comes to scent into my daily life so that later on I can keep up this habit and it then that's going to help me maintain my sense of smell. So treat the senses like a muscle and continue to train them so you don't lose them. Exactly. Sure. So uh, we've, we've talked about a lot of things here. Uh, most of them touched on in, in your book, Why You Eat What You Eat. Uh, so I want to have you, you know, part of, part of the reason for this podcast is to give people actionable tools and techniques. I think we've done a lot of that, but if you could break down the key takeaways uh, into some bite-sized tips uh, and and techniques for people to, to use to build, you know, not just change how they're looking at the, the choices that they're making, but actually to build a sustainable lifestyle change in terms of their relationship with food. Well, the simplest message that I can give is just take a moment to think about your experience of eating if you're eating in a state not for hunger. So if you're, you know, truly physically hungry and you're eating, you need to do that, you know, physiologically. But if you're eating just for pleasure, just take a moment to think about the pleasure you're experiencing balanced with the outcome of eating that you may not necessarily want. So for instance, let's say I really want to eat a slice of chocolate cake. Okay. The other thing being, I don't want people to deny themselves. You should not be thinking in terms of restricting, like I'm not going to eat this and I'm not going to eat that and so forth. So rather than thinking in a restrictive way, give yourself freedom when it comes to food that, you know, more or less just about anything you can have at least a little bit of, mm. but this is what I want you to think about. The first bite is the pleasure worth it. Absolutely. Second bite, probably still pretty good. Third bite. No, maybe also okay. But as we continue, 
it starts to become less intensely pleasurable. And when you feel like, okay, that pleasure is, you know, falling down, that's when you start to say to yourself, I can stop. I'm not physically hungry. And I now I'm going to put my fork down and I haven't finished either the slice or the whole cake or whatever the case might be. And what this involves is just slowing down ever so slightly to check in with yourself to find out whether or not this is really worth it from a pleasure perspective, because very easily these things we do for pleasure can turn into pain if we start feeling guilty, if we start feeling upset with ourselves and so forth. So just to avoid that whole side of the equation, Mm -hmm. not to mention the fact that this might be not healthy for you or you're concerned about weight gain and so forth, but to keep everything in the positive side and to also feel like you can trust yourself to make good choices about what you're eating and to have a happier and healthier relationship with food. Just taking that brief moment to kind of analyze that pleasure lack thereof equation and where you are within that, you know, sort of seesaw that will help you, I think really a lot with respect to food. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, please. Okay, just uh, if I, I'll go on a couple, a couple of other ones, <laughs> little ones. So we've already kind of talked about this, but but avoiding ultra processed food is, I think, something else. So a lot of us can avoid, you know, getting things that are in packages. You know, we have to go to the grocery store. There's there's probably you know packaging around everything, and rather than being at a farmer's market where it can just like take the take the food and however form it's in. But with respect to packaged food, you know, sort of look at the ingredient list. If there are you know, more than, you know, five words and or lots of words which you don't understand the meaning of, then it's probably something that you should not consume regularly. Because what is going on with all the packaging and the additives that are, or rather the additives that are in a lot of packaged foods is that they actually could be having effects on our metabolism that are still not yet even completely figured out. Mm. And altering the way our body is able to process those foods, not just in the immediate term, but especially if those are kinds of foods we're eating long term, they could have effects on our body that sort of long term are changing our microbiome, which is also an extremely important factor we haven't gotten into at all. But sort of physiology of our microbiome has a lot to do with our metabolism, and the way that we're able to process food as well, and, you know, you know, get the proper nutrients from it, be able to burn calories and so forth. And so a lot of the, the ingredients that go into hyper-processed foods can alter our microbiome in, in negative ways. So that would be, you know, another basic thing is to sort of look at the look at the ingredients. And then finally, just as a kind of a behavioral thing is if you have a habit, like whenever I sit down in front of the TV, I have the bowl of, you know, peanuts or I bring in the potato chips or whenever I get in the car for a long trip, I have my stack of snacks beside me and whatever it is, you know, You can sort of try to break those things up. Do I really need it? Um, Maybe I will put it in the back seat rather than keeping it in the seat beside me in the car. You know, a couple of these sort of simple behavioral things, which also kind of take advantage of our natural laziness. Like you mentioned early on in the conversation that, you know, we're not programmed to exercise. Um, And that is because we don't want to be expending energy all over the place because, you know, in our evolution, we did not have a lot of energy to spare, as it were, you know, we wanted to conserve it because we didn't have that much nutrients available to us all the time. So if you can move the snacks, let's say into the back seat, so you'd have to stop and then get into the back of the car to get them. And then you'll have a chance to think about, do I really want them? Or from the point of view of, let's say, watching TV, keep things in another room. So you have to get up from the couch, go in and get it rather than it being in front of you. Just those little easy behavioral tweaks uh, within your environment in a very small way can actually potentially help break habits that might not be good for you. Yeah, absolutely. I find that uh, changing my environment is is probably the biggest thing with making habitual, you know, healthy choices. What are you working on now? Is there any research that you're currently conducting? Any, are you expanding upon this work or, or exploring something new? So the work that I'm doing right now really focuses on our sense of smell and its relationship to health and something that I like to call real aromatherapy mm. in the sense of how, in the sense of, I like, can't help but use that word all the time. <laughs> so how... Time you know, smells, sense in our in our world can have an actual impact on our 
mental and physical health and the mechanisms behind that, the, the real scientific mechanisms, not the sort of aromatherapy, sort of traditional ideas behind it, but really how that could be working for us and, and ways to take advantage of that and, and manipulate those things for ourselves, because a lot of it is sort of very personally curated, as well as the fact that the sense of smell in and of itself is really deeply connected to the functioning of our body and our brain. And a bellwether for all kinds of aspects of our mortality and longevity and sort of understanding, you know, and being able to explain to people the uh, the relationship between those two things and how people can, as you also asked me, maintain a healthy sense of smell and also use their sense of smell as a, as a signal. You know, if you start to see that you're losing your sense of smell, what you can do proactively to try to sort of investigate what is going on there and get in, let's just say, if it's early stages of another neurological illness or another kind of illness at the, you know, if you get in early enough, um, potentially preventing it from developing further or making sure that the treatment you have is actually going to maintain, you know, your lifespan and health span as long as possible with whatever it is. That's great. Well, I look forward to seeing that and possibly talking to you further about it when uh, when you get further along down in that mission. Uh, so where can people find you? I know you, you have a website. Um, you've got your book out. Where can people um, get in contact with you? Well, my website is probably the best uh, way to find me. My you know contact information is on the website. I'm also on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn. So those are sort of the social media uh, things that I use. So those are you know probably the easiest ways for people to contact me. Awesome. Well, everybody get the book. It's called Why You Eat What You Eat, The Science Behind Our Relationship with Food. It really provides a lot of clarity in an otherwise confusing industry. <laughs> so thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much, Ahmed. I'm delighted to be your inaugural guest. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Dr. Rachel Hers. Her most recent book is Why You Eat What You Eat, The Science Behind Our Relationship with Food, which you can find on Amazon.com and in bookstores everywhere. If you're interested in learning more about the book, listening to her TED Talk, or finding out more about her work, please visit the show notes. If you haven't done so already, I'd be so grateful if you'd take one minute of your time to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have done so, thank you. Also, if you enjoyed this episode and you have friends and loved ones that you think might get something out of it, please consider sharing it with them. Last but not least, the purpose of this show is to explore strategies and techniques to improve our lives and assist our efforts at self-mastery. So remember not only to listen, but apply. Until next time.